Living color 
Welcome to Grace Fellowship Online. My name is Adam Shin, and I'm the broadcast director here at Grace. And we want to thank you so much for streaming with us today. Hey, if you're watching on YouTube or you're watching on Facebook, hey, how about subscribe to our page or give us a follow? That would be awesome. Now, Pastor Tony today is going to continue his series called The Comeback about the life of Zachariah. It's going to be a great day here at Grace. So let's get started because our service begins right now.
we're so glad you're with us this morning. I want to share a scripture with you before we sing this next song. It comes from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. It says, so then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe, that this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same things, all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. And because of that, we can boldly come to the throne of our gracious God, where we'll receive his mercy, where we'll find his grace to help us when we need it most. We can't take for granted the presence of God in this place, in our lives, with you at home, if you're worshiping with us at home. Don't take his presence for granted because everything can change in his presence. Everything comes together in his presence. He's working all things together for our good. And it's in his presence that we can find healing. It's, the Bible says in his presence we find freedom. And it says that in his presence we can come boldly before his throne and we'll find mercy and we'll find grace for the things that we're dealing with.
Thank you, Lord, for your presence. We don't take it for granted today, God, that you promised to be with us. God, in the greatest expression of love that you stepped out of eternity, that you stepped out of heaven into human flesh to endure our weaknesses, to endure our burdens, to endure our sin, to pay the ultimate price. God, not just so that we'd be forgiven, but so that we would know, that we would know that we would know, that no matter what moment in life, no matter what difficulty we're facing, God, that we have a high priest that is not unsympathetic. He understands. You understand, God. You know. You've been there. And you're here with us today to walk through it with us. Yea, that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But you are with me. Mm. It's a beautiful promise this morning. Thank you for all the things you do, but most of all, just that you're with us today and always. We thank you. In Jesus' name, and everybody say, amen. Amen. It's good to be in the presence of the Lord this morning. Amen. I'm glad you chose to be with us for you online. Uh, that are joining us. Hey, whatever platform you're watching on, go to the chat real quick. Let us know where you're watching from so we can say hello. And if you're a first time viewer, pause your screen through this QR and click this QR code on your phone. And so we can give you some more information about our church and say thank you so much for viewing with us. Well, good morning, Grace Fellowship. 
We want to thank you for your continued support and giving over the past few weeks and months. One of our great values here at Grace is generosity. Our God is generous and you guys have been as well. We want to remind you of the three ways that you can give here at Grace. First, you can go online to graceathens.com using either your phone or your laptop and give using the button at the top of the page. Second, if you prefer to give here in person on campus this morning, we're going to have ushers stationed at the back of the sanctuary, the exit doors, with buckets where you can drop off your offering. And lastly, you can also mail in your offering or drop it by the office during the week as well. Again, thank you guys for your continued generosity and God bless you. Good morning. I want to invite you to our nurseries that have been scrubbed clean and sparkling in our children's church where everyone is six feet apart ready for some serious fun this morning. So come on, join us in the nursery or children's church for a fun day this Sunday. Did you know that Grace has a YouTube channel? From Pastor Tony's recent messages to our creative videos to everything we produce is on that channel just for you. So all you gotta do is go to YouTube and search Grace Fellowship Athens or go to our website, select the media, select sermons, and you're there. Go ahead and subscribe to us and every time we put a new video up, you'll get a notification. Have you been looking for a way to serve our community and those in need? Well, we have an opportunity for you. On January 26th, right here in our Grace Hall from 10 until 4, we will host a blood drive with the American Red Cross. If you would like to serve our community by giving blood, please visit redcrossblood.org and search Grace to sign up today. Well, good morning, everyone. Great to see you today. Thanks so much for coming out, being a part of our service here at Grace Fellowship. I trust that today has been a blessing for you, those who were able to come on campus. And good morning to all of you who are watching online. Boy, do we miss seeing you guys. And we realize that the majority of our church still is worshiping through the virtual and digital means. And we just want you to know this morning, we miss you guys. We know it's not right for many of you to come back quite yet because of the uptick in COVID. But we want you to know we think about you. You're not forgetting gotten and we just can't wait to see you again we love you guys we're praying for you and we know that there are some folks today who are at home having to watch because you've been isolated or maybe you're sick or you have someone in your family that's going through a really difficult time and uh, we want you to know we're praying for you matter of fact we want to know what's going on in your life if there's something we can pray about please let us know it is an honor to be able to pray for you uh, these are difficult times we're working through but God's being gracious to us but but please be in prayer for your church as well. I know there were five families last week in our church that had to uh, uh, say goodbye to a loved one. And so there's a lot going on with this COVID. And we're just praying God's grace and mercy for you and your family. And we just cannot wait till we can see you again. We do love you and thank God that you're a part of our service this morning. We do want to say again, if I can echo for just a moment what Gabe was saying in the announcements. Thank you so much for your generosity. You have been so generous through this pandemic and all that's been going on. And uh, thank you because not only is it helping us continue to work in ministry here at Grace and in Oconee County and around our community, but you know, one of our great values is missions. And we've been able to continue to support our missionaries around the world who are having to deal with this as well. And you have not, because of your generosity, they haven't missed anything from us. And actually, we've been able to do above and beyond. And I want to just say to you, thanks be to God for that. Missions is a high value here because it's a high value for God. And uh, one of the missionaries that we love and one of the missions we love to support is Kids First Ministry. Many of you have been in Grace. You're familiar with this. It is directed by Larry and Lawson Bowling. It is a ministry into the inner city communities of Athens, Georgia. It reaches specifically to children who are underserved and underprivileged. And it goes into their housing projects and loves on them, shares with them, supplies needs. But most importantly, it shares the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Larry Bowling has been doing this for 15 years. 
years, just week in and out, week out, week in and week out, and they've seen kids graduate through high school, go into college, and we know it's because of their ministry. Larry was sharing with us back last year that he felt like the Lord was speaking to him about a change in his ministry. And as God began to reveal that to us, uh, we saw what God was doing. Uh, Larry is about to leave and take a long-term missional assignment in Jamaica where he is going to be working with special needs children, loving them, serving them, preaching the gospel to them. Today is Larry's last day at Grace before he leaves. And I've asked Larry and his daughter uh, Lawson to come up and tell us a little bit about that. Would you welcome them to the stage this morning? Come on up, guys. It's great to see you this morning. Larry, thanks so much for being here. Tell us a little bit about this mission work you'll be doing in Jamaica and uh, all that God has kind of spoken to your life. Absolutely. The, the, the vision for this actually started about 28 years ago. I was sitting in a church service like this, and I forgot this the last time, but it was Tracy Reynolds who had just taken a youth group to Jamaica and came back and talked about an orphanage they visited. And right then, uh, God said, that's where you're going right now. Well, in the time that, that happened, I met uh, my future wife. Uh, we got engaged, and I left <laughs> her to, to get the wedding, wedding ready while I went to Jamaica. So that was a nice part for me. But uh, that didn't work out. God had other plans. That mission was kind of falling apart. But the, the vision for working with kids uh, in, in Jamaica has never left. Since then, my daughter, Lawson, and I have been back seven or eight times in the last few years. Uh, it was two years ago that God began to really stir in both our hearts uh, of this mission uh, for these special needs kids. The ultimate goal is that we want to uh, have a school in a few years, but what we're gonna do right now is just meet needs of kids in the community. Uh, they have a hard time getting transportation to the doctor. Uh, they have medical supply needs that are not being met. And I'm just gonna go in and, and begin to identify these kids and find where they are, uh, begin to minister to them, and uh, begin to transport them to church. They never get to do that, so that's something we're going to do. Uh, so we're just very excited just about getting on the ground and, and getting started a week from now. Isn't that remarkable? I mean, you know, if you, if you have special needs children in your life or you know a family that does, you know there's a lot of challenges even in America with trying to get medical, educational, all the things that they need. Uh, in a developing world nation like Jamaica with the poverty as it is, can you imagine? So thank God that God sends his people into these places for his glory to shine the light of Christ. And we thank God for that. Now, Lawson, I, I yes. should say one other thing. In Jamaica and a lot of Caribbean islands, they consider those kids cursed. And so for us to come in and share the gospel wow. has just been a big deal. Wow, wow. Now, Lawson, you'll be taking over the directorship of Kids First. Is that correct? Tell yes. us about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so Kids First is a weekly ministry. We go to two locations, um, government housing neighborhoods in Athens. Um, and we meet with groups of kids um, and minister to them. We have uh, a Bible lesson and food and games, and we just disciple them and get to know them. Um, right now, during COVID, we have had to shorten our program a little bit, so we're not there as long. Um, but we have been able, because of COVID, we're doing these smaller groups of kids, and we're able to kind of um, get more one-on-one -on -one time, and we've really been able to build more community there. So that's been kind of a gift. Um, and so now we're making YouTube videos um, to kind of shorten our lessons so you can check us out at Kids First Athens on YouTube. But that's kind of what we do. And in all of that, our goal is just to show the love of Christ to kids in Athens. That's awesome. Now, recently you guys have just launched, you're launching a new website where people can stay informed with Kids First here in Athens and along with what you're doing in Jamaica. What's the web address for me? Yeah, um, it is Kids First fam, like family, F-A-M, dot com. And on the website is our email address if you want to contact us and a bunch of information about what we do. So That's going to be great, exciting, and we're so thankful. Would you stand with me, please? And we just want to pray a blessing over them as they take this next step of their journey. And one of the ancient expressions of our faith is that we would stretch our hands towards those that we're praying for as though we were actually laying hands on them. So if you don't mind, would you stretch your hand towards them? And can we just pray a blessing over them now? Father God, we thank you for Larry and Lawson Bowling. We thank you for their life. We thank you for their testimony. Lord, we have watched them in such grace walk 
out the past several years of their life through tragedy and difficulty and triumph. And God, you have been faithful. You have made a way where there seemed to be no way. And now you have called them to this new work. And I pray for Larry as he goes to Jamaica that, God, you would give him favor. You would open up every door. You would direct every step. You would give him grace and mercy, supply and provision. Father, we pray your blessings upon him. And we thank you for all the people in Jamaica who don't even know what's going on right now. But God, in this service, we're praying and we're believing you're going to respond. And Father, we pray for Lawson as she takes over Kids First here in Athens. That God, you would give her insight and wisdom. And God, you would supply every need that she has. Father, we thank you for them. We bless them. We strengthen them. And we rejoice in what you're doing in, with, and through their life. In Jesus' name. And together we said, amen. Come on, give the Lord a big God bless you. And and thank you guys so much. Well, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, would you open them with me to the book of Zechariah? Zechariah is a prophet of the Old Testament. Uh, He wrote about 500 years before the birth of Christ. His name means the Lord remembers. This is a book of comfort. This is a book of hope. This is a book of turn around and come back to a group of people who were discouraged, frustrated, and felt as though they were stuck. This book has much to say to us in the world that we're living in today. Zechariah chapter 1 verses 7 through about 17 today will be our text. Now let me ask you this as we jump off into this message. If you were asked to define what is the Christian symbol of our faith, how would you respond? Chances are you may not have thought about that very often, but you would say, well, it's the cross. And when we see the cross, it makes us think of Christ. It makes us think of his church. Really, wherever you go around the world, when you see a cross on a building, you know that that is a Christian church or Christian organization. The cross is the symbol of our faith. And we love the cross, don't we? We love all that it represents. It is the place in which God demonstrated his love for us. It's the place where our sins were paid for. And we love the cross. We love it in our buildings. We love it on our buildings. We wear it around our neck. Some of you got it tatted up on your body. You love the cross because it's the symbol of our faith and it reminds us of so much. But did you know that if you went back to the first, second, or maybe even third century church, the Christian church, and if you were to walk in to that building and you saw a cross, you would be horrified. You would be stunned. You would think that there was some type of terroristic, domestic terrorism taking place in your building because the cross has not always been the symbol of the Christian faith. Matter of fact, it wasn't the symbol of the Christian faith until the fourth century. For the first four centuries, the symbol of our faith was one, the Good Shepherd. And the oldest art that we have in the catacombs of Christian faith, we discover that Christians identified the Good Shepherd as the symbol of the faith because Christ said, I am the Good Shepherd, and the Good Shepherd symbol would be of a shepherd carrying a lamb. And it would remind us that it is the Lord who came, and He rescued us, and He picked us, and He brought us to Himself. What a beautiful image that symbol is. And then the second symbol of our faith became the ichthus. It's that little fish that some of you have on the back of your car, a bumper sticker, or a license plate, or maybe you've even tatted that up on you. And it was an early symbol because the Christians knew that Jesus had called them to be fishers of men. The cross did not actually become the symbol of our faith until the 4th century when Emperor Constantine came to faith in Christ and then declared that the entire Roman Empire would be a Christian empire. One night before his army was to go to war, he had a dream. And in that dream, he saw a blazing cross. He woke up the next morning and gave instructions to his military that every soldier's shield should be painted with a cross. Thus beginning the symbol of the cross as the Christian church. You say, well, that's, that's interesting, Tony, but what does that really have to do with maybe what you're talking about today? Today, as we continue in our study on the life and times of Zechariah, we get into eight different visions that Zechariah had 
that God was communicating to his people through. And when we look at these ancient visions, these ancient symbols, it's very important that we recognize that how we view them through 21st century Western postmodernity lenses may not be the way the original listeners would have viewed them. And so one of the most important things you and I will ever do as we study the Bible is we begin with this question, what is the context that this letter has been given to? What did this mean to the original hearers of the message? What did the original readers understand this to mean? And chances are, it can look substantially different to us initially in the 21st century than it did 500 years before the birth of Christ. And as we get into these eight different visions, we're going to see some crazy symbolism. We're going to see flying scrolls. We're going to see horns and plumb lines. And we're going to see myrtle trees and all these colored horses. Well, it's important for us to kind of understand what they mean. Because God gave these symbols in order to comfort His people who were discouraged, who were frustrated, and who felt abandoned. And if we can step back to understand what God was truly saying to this unique people at a unique time concerning unique circumstances, we can then take the precepts and the principles of that moment and apply it to our life because God's Word is not an ancient history manual. God's Word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's more applicable to your life today than the news you'll hear about tomorrow. So we take these principles and these truths and we bring them into the context of our world and we too find the same comfort and hope and direction for our life. All right, are you ready now? Let's jump into the book of Zechariah, chapter number 1. Now as you're turning there, verse number 7 will begin. Let me remind you, Zechariah is speaking to people who are deeply discouraged. They've been overwhelmed. They've come back after 70 years of slavery to the Babylonians. Their cities are destroyed. Their enemies are raging all around them. They feel as though they have no resources. They remember how good the old days were, but now they're having to navigate a new normal, and they didn't like it. And they felt overwhelmed. Zechariah shows up on the scene, a prophet. A prophet is one who speaks for God. And his name is the first moment of comfort. Zechariah means the Lord remembers. We talked about it last week. God remembers us. God has not forgotten us, his people. God has not abandoned us. And the Bible says that Zechariah stands up and he says, if you will repent and turn to God, you'll discover that God has turned to you. And in this position of repentance, God is about to unleash these unbelievable promises and assurance and power in your life. Last week, we dealt with repentance, and I pray that you have sat in that this week and have allowed the Holy Spirit. Now, this week, we get into what God is going to do with a repentant people, even in a dark, difficult place. Zechariah chapter number 1, verse 7, and continuing. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah. Now, I want you to notice there, you may want to underline this, and I hope if you're at home, you have your Bible and you'll keep it open and you'll make notes. But I want you, Zechariah begins, this is the word of God. This is not the word of the prophet. This isn't the word of a teacher, but this is God who is transmitting truth through this prophet. And verse number 8 says, And I saw by night. This is a night vision. His eyes are opened up. He sees something that God pulls back, the bifold realities of this universe. And Zechariah the prophet begins to see the first of what's going to be eight visions. And he says, And I saw by night. And behold, a man riding a red horse. And it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow. 
And behind him were horses, red, sorrel, or your translation may say brown, and white. Verse number 9 says, Then I said, Zechariah that is, My Lord, what are these? Well, if there was ever an appropriate question this morning, I think it's that, right? Okay, what, what's this? What's all this imagery that we see being laid out here? What would it have meant to the Israelites some 2,500 years ago? Let me go down the five images that we see. Let me give you a definition, then I'll kind of pull them together for us for a moment, all right? First of all, we see a man riding on a red horse. First question we would ask is, who is this man? Who is this person on the horse? And most all theologians and historians agree, this is Christ who is sitting upon this horse. If you'll jump down in your Bible, you'll notice verse number 11. It says that the angel of the Lord who is on this horse, the angel of the Lord. Notice there in verse 11, the angel of the Lord. Depending on your publisher of your Bible... Uh, hopefully they uh, capitalized all those words. That this is speaking of deity. Anytime when you see the angel of the Lord capitalized, it is speaking of deity. We see angels of the Lord and they're not capitalized. It's not showing the proper noun. But here, the angel of the Lord. So this is an Old Testament reality of Christ appearing in the Old Testament before his incarnation when he was born of the Virgin Mary. Theologically, we refer to this as a Christophany. A Christophany is Christ appearing in the Old Testament before his incarnation. And there's several accounts of this in the Old Testament. Uh, one of them is when Abraham went out and he met Melchizedek. Remember that story? He was the priestly king from Salem. And they had communion. That's the first Christophany we had. Christ appeared to Abraham. And that's why Jesus said, when Abraham saw me in his day. When Joshua is getting ready to go into battle against Jericho. Remember that night he's out walking and the Bible says, the angel of the Lord, the captain of the Lord's army appears to Joshua. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they're thrown into the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar, the wicked king, says, wait a minute, didn't we throw three men into the fire? Why are there four? And the fourth one looks like the Son of God. The reason it looks like the Son of God because Christ appears in that moment. It's called a Christophany. Now... For the Jewish people, they knew that this angel, this, this divine one, would come during their pines of history. And now Zacharias sees this Lord, the Lord, sitting there, and he's on a red horse. Horses would have made a lot of sense to the Jewish people during this time. They would have made sense to nearly all people at this time. Because horses were a, uh, an instrument of warfare, of authority, of power. It was when an army came into town, they would come riding their horses into town. And that there was about to be a conflict. There was about to be a battle. And we see here Christ sitting on this red horse. And red typically means judgment at some level. Now I want you to think about this. When Jesus came in the incarnation, when he was born of Mary and then he had his earthly ministry. Do you remember how he came into the city? He came in on a lowly donkey. He came in in peace. He came in uh, uh, proclaiming peace to the nations that would choose and follow him. The book of Revelation says when Christ comes again, he's going to be coming on a white victorious horse. He's coming to execute his righteous eternal reign. So now we have a picture of Christ on this horse that is beginning to build this imagery of a military conflict, a battle. Third thing we see here are the myrtle trees. That Christ is on this red horse of authority, of power, of might among the myrtle trees. The myrtle trees, according to nearly all historians and theologians and rabbinical thought, is the myrtle trees were a picture of the nation of Israel itself. Now this is interesting because throughout the Old Testament we think about the beautiful cedars of Lebanon or the great oak trees. Myrtle trees were not majestic trees. They were low-growing shrubs, six or eight feet tall. Uh, you would easily overlook them. You wouldn't think much about them except in the spring when they would bloom and be very fragrant. We have myrtle trees a, 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 a akin of that, a, a species of that even today. Uh, they're called the crepe myrtle. 
And chances are you have these in your home or in your neighborhood. And usually about this time every year, in my neighborhood at least, we commit crepe myrtle murder. You know what I'm talking about? We cut those things back so much that you just have these like, you know, uh, uh, sticks or, or branches or, or star, whatever, stump, whatever those things are. They just come up out of the ground about this high and you look at them and think, man, they look terrible. They look horrible. They're not majestic. They're not beautiful. They're bare. They're naked. They're unfruitful. And it's just a stick looks like coming out of the ground. But you know this, right? You know that in the spring when the sun shines on them and the earth warms up, they're going to bud and they're going to bring forth a beautiful flower and they're going to be fragrant again. This is a picture. Here are the people of God who feel as though they have been cut back. They're naked. They're exposed. There's no beauty. There's no fragrance about them. But in the middle of that is Christ, their defender, their mighty warrior, the one who goes to battle. Now watch this third, fourth thing. Where were the myrtle trees? What's the Bible say? It says it was in a hollow or a low place. Uh, this was not a high place that they were in. It was in a low place. And what's interesting about this is Zechariah prophesied in the city of Jerusalem. And we know geographically that the city of Jerusalem is on a high place in Jerusalem. Which is to say that we can be geographically in a high place, but emotionally and spiritually and relationally in a low place. Can I get an amen? Amen. So here's the people of God who are low, who are bare, who are naked, who are exposed, where there's no beauty or majesty, but the Lord is in with them in this low place. And then finally is this. And it says that behind him, behind the Lord, were horses, red, brown, white. And rabbinical thought is that on each of these horses, there were the angels of the Lord. That there is a picture here that the Lord with his heavenly angels, his heavenly army, has gathered with his people in a low place. Not to judge them, not to break them. But the big idea is that God is about to lead them out again into a place of beauty and victory. Here's God's picture of a humiliated and a humble people who had repented and turned their hearts towards the Lord and that the Lord himself was with them and among them and the angels of heaven had come to gather to fight with the Lord who is the defender of his people and the Lord met with them at a low place so that he may bring them back to a place where his glory is revealed and their life is fragrant and their life is beautiful and their life is fruitful again friends do you see how this must have what this must have meant to the people of Israel how this must have stirred their heart that God has not forgotten you God has not abandoned you but now because you have repented and you have turned your heart towards God and you have looked to him and you've confessed your sin God says now I will be in the midst of my people and I will be your defender I will be your great warrior I will fight and the armies of heaven will fight with me and I'm going to bring you up out of this low place and where you're naked and exposed and broken. I'm going to bring new life into your life and I'm going to return you to the glory that I have called you to. This is the imagery that Zechariah gives to the people. And why does he give us this imagery? Because it should emote an emotional response in our life. God's just not given us information, but he is pulling a picture that is emotionally connected with the heart of his people. And I'm here to pro proclaim to us this morning. We who are repentant and have turned our hearts towards God, though we may be in a low place and we may be struggling with COVID and we may be struggling with the political uh, environment, and it seems as everything in our world's gone crazy. The Lord Himself is among His people today and He is our defender. He is our warrior. He is our great high priest and we can believe He can bring us out of this low place to a place of His beauty again. Hallelujah. Be to God. Would you give the Lord praise today if you believe that? Come on. If you really believe that, give the Lord praise in the house of the Lord today. So this is the imagery that's happening. Now, 
it would have made sense to the Israelites. God is with me. He has not forgotten me. God is here. Let's continue reading our text. <coughs> Verse 9. Then I said, what are these, my Lord? So the angel who talked with me said, I will show you what they were. And the man who stood among the tr- myrtle trees answered and said, These are the ones from whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth. And they answered the angel, the Lord, who stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro throughout the earth. And behold, the earth is resting quietly. Okay, i got to unpack this for just a moment. First of all, there are two angels that appear in the story. There is the angel of the Lord who is seated upon the th- horse in the midst of the myrtle tree. And then there is an angel that seems to be kind of like a tour guide for Zechariah, who's kind of walking Zechariah through the scene. It's as though Zechariah might be here, and the angel uh, that's helping him understand is beside him. And off over there is the scene where the Lord himself, the angel of the Lord, Christ himself, is seated upon this horse among the myrtle trees in a low place with the other horses and the angels of God ready for battle. So now Zechariah is having this conversation with this other angel, if you will. And he asks him this question. He says, hey, uh, what exactly is going on here? And verse number 10 says, these are the ones whom the Lord has sent out to walk to and fro throughout the earth. He said, okay, what are these other guys on the horses? What's going on here? And he gets an answer. Well, these guys, these are the ones who went out on a recon mission. They're the God squad, if you will, who went out all around the earth. And now they're reporting back to the Lord what they have seen. Now, again, to the Israelites living in this time period, that would have made perfect sense because every king of every kingdom would send out his emissaries his military men, his spies on horses, and they would go into the different parts of the kingdom to find out and get a report and report back to the king, this is what's going on in this province. This is what's going on in the south. And this is what's going on in the north. And they're coming back and they're reporting. Now to the Israelites, they would have made perfect sense because they had seen the Persian leaders and military guys come into their cities and figure out what's going on and go back and report. So what is this saying here? Here the Lord is among his people and these angels are responding back to the Lord. This is what's taking place. Here's the big idea being communicated here. Just as the king of this world, Darius, knows what's going on in his kingdom, God is saying to his people, I, the Lord your God, I know what's going on in the earth. I know what's happening in the world. See, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, the Lord says, The eyes of the Lord go to and fro, seeking whom he may show himself strong on behalf of. I I want you to know this morning, friend, God knows what's going on in the world. God knows what's going on in the high places and in the low places. He knows what's being done in secret. He knows where there's justice and injustice. He knows where there's righteousness and unrighteousness. He knows everything that's going on in the world right now. He does not have to be brought up to speed about your world. Let me tell you, not only does God know what's going on in the world, He knows what's going on in your world. He knows what's going on in your earth. And isn't that comforting to know? Sometimes we approach God as though we got to bring him up to speed with what's going on in our life. But here we discover the Lord has already got the report about our life. And then notice what it says here. And it says, They reported to the Lord, We have walked all over the earth, and behold, the, all the earth is resting quietly. Your translation may actually say, The rest of the world is at peace. Now that's interesting. On surface level, we think, Oh, all the other nations are not at war. This is a good thing. But this really isn't a good thing when you dig down into this Hebrew statement. What it really speaks of and would translate well in is that the rest of the world is in the selfish indifference towards God. The whole earth has turned its back against God, against His name, 
And the people that God has chosen for himself, the Israelites, who are to be the mouthpiece of God in the earth, they're in a low, broken place. And the angels of the Lord come back and say, we need you to know this. The angels explain this to Zechariah. The Lord sees that right now there is great indifference in the earth. And he is about to deal with that indifference. But in dealing with that indifference, he is not going to forget his people. He is going to be faithful to his people. And his mission for his people will not change. It will not be set aside. It will be accomplished. In other words, do you sit here sometimes so frustrated saying, God, here I am trying to love you, serve you, do right. And it seems like every time I try to serve you well, it's three steps backwards. It seems like people that don't love you, don't serve you, do not do righteously. Lord, it seems like they always get the promotion. It seems like they always get the better job. It seems like they always have the nicer this or the better that and all that other stuff. And it seems like the, it seems like the unrighteous get ahead when the righteous are getting plunged. And the Lord says, I see what's going on, that there's great indifference, but there is coming a day of reckoning. But for those who are my people, I'm bringing them up and I'm bringing them out. And now let's continue reading. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 12. Then the angel of the Lord answered. He gets this report. The report is your people are struggling. The nations are mocking you. They have this indifference towards you, O God. And now the angel of the Lord, Christ himself, answers and he says these words after receiving that report. O Lord of hosts, how long will you have not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which you were angry these 70 years? Now we see something remarkable. This defender of our life, Christ, who is there to fight with us and fight for us and bring us to a place of victory, we see him in a position of intercession. That he is praying to the Lord God Almighty, Almighty God the Father, and he's saying, Father, how much longer will you allow this to go on? Will you not be merciful to your people? Will you not be gracious to them? Will you not bring them up and out of this? And I'm telling you, this is such a beautiful moment here because it tells us that not only is Jesus our great warrior, not as he not only is he our defender, but he is the one who intercedes for our life. Will read you a beautiful passage this morning during worship that talked about Jesus as the high priest. And that high, as a high priest, you know what he does? He's praying for you right now. Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father, and he is praying for you right now. He is interceding on behalf of you right now. There are times in my life when I wonder, is there anyone praying for me? And the evil one will whisper in my ear, there's no one who cares. No one's praying for you. And I remind myself, oh yes, there is. Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of God the Father is praying for me right here, right now. He's saying, Father, you remember Tony. You remember that he has trusted us. You remember that my blood was shed for him. You remember that he is depending on you. You remember, oh God, your promises to him. And Father, I pray for him. Jesus is interceding for his own people. Christ is interceding for us today. I don't know if what that does for you. But I pray it comforts you. And then notice this as we get ready to close. And it says, then the angel of the Lord. <coughs> verse 13. And the Lord answered the angel and he talked to me. With good and comforting words. This image is being built that here is the people of God where the Lord is in the midst of them, ready for conflict and battle to lead them back into victory as the Lord is interceding and praying. And the word, Lord's word to them was not anger and judgment. What was it? It was good and comforting words. For those of us who would repent and lean into the Lord, His words for us are good and comforting. Good and comforting words. What were they? These are them. Verse 14. And the angel spoke to me who said, Proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem. He says, I am zealous for Zion with a great zeal. 
He says, I love my people. And I want to be with my people. And I want to bless my people. And these are my people and I am jealous for them. I love them with a passion. God loves you today with a passion. He is jealous for you. And then he gives us these words, words of hope. Let me give them to you. Four quick words. These are what he says. I want you to proclaim number one. The first word is this word return. Verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I'm returning to Jerusalem with mercy. No more will Ichabod, no more will Jerusalem be known as Ichabod, where the Spirit of the Lord has departed. He says, I'm coming back. Why? Because in your repentance you have made a place for me. The Lord is returned as we have returned to the Lord. And His glory is coming back to our life. The second word is this. It's the word restoration. Not only is the Lord returning, but He's going to restore that which the enemy has destroyed. He's going to restore that which has been torn down. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 16 The second part says, My house shall be built again. It's not going to always be in ruin. I know all you see is broken down churches and broken down people. But he says, I'm coming back and I'm returning and I'm going to be restoring my house to the glory that I desire for it. And they began to work. And four years after Zechariah said this, guess what? The temple was rebuilt and the glory of God filled that place. Here's the third word. It's the word reconstruction. He says, I'm going to reconstruct not just the temple. I'm going to reconstruct your life. Notice this in verse number 16. It says, and a surveyor's line will be stretched out all over Jerusalem. I had to think about this for a moment. A survey, what did that mean? When we built the building that is now where our fellowship hall is and children's ministry and you saw all that big building behind us. I was so excited. It was the first building project I ever done as a pastor. And we were getting ready to break ground and lay the foundation. I was stunned that they did not start with bulldozers and land movers. They started with stakes and strings. And they went out and they put stakes in this ground and they started pulling these strings. And I said, well, this is going to take a long time if we're going to build this with string. The general contractor said, no, the strings are just where the foundation will be, where the footers will be, where the plumbing will go, where the electrical inlets will come. And that's what the Lord is saying to his people now. Listen, I'm coming back. I'm going to rebuild and I'm going to stretch his string. It won't be built overnight. But he says, if you'll stay with me, I'm going to rebuild my church. And the fourth thing is this word reassurance. He gives them this word of reassurance. Let me read you these final passages. Zechariah chapter number 1 verse 17. And again proclaim, loudly proclaim, thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities shall again spread out through prosperity. God's saying, it's not going to be a little bitty thing I'm going to do, but because you've turned your heart towards me, it's going to spread out. And my glory is going to fill the earth. And verse 17 says, And I will again, listen, comfort Zion. And I will again choose Jerusalem. One of the favorite things I get to do as a pastor is watch people grow in their marriages. And one of the great blessings that I have in my life are many people who have been married 50 and 60 years. And And I know their stories and the hardships and the difficulties. And I love it when they come around to anniversaries. And sometimes at that 50th or that 60th anniversary, they'll have a big gathering and celebrate it. And inevitably, they'll say this to one another. If I had to do it all over again, I'd choose you again. With all the ups, with all the downs, with all the disappointments, heartaches, and all that, I would choose you again. It's one of the most precious moments of those gatherings. That's what the Lord is saying to us right here. He says to Israel, I know you disobeyed. I know you rebelled. I know you played the harlot. 
I know you worshiped other gods. I know you were stiff-necked and hard-hearted. You would turn my way. I know you got yourself in a big old nasty mess, and I know that you have hurt my heart. But God says, but I would choose it all over again. If I had to go back and do it all over again, the Lord says, I would choose you. This is the promise of God to a people in a low place. I am going to be your warrior. I'm going to be your defender. I'm going to be your intercessor. And I'm going to be the restorer of the years that the locust and the canker worm has eaten in your life. And that's why Paul said in Philippians 1 verse 6, I am confident of this very thing, that he who started a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me and pray? Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you for this time. And I pray now, Holy Spirit of God, you would take this word and you would place it deep in our heart and our mind. I pray, oh God, that Lord, even though those that feel overwhelmed and discouraged, that, oh God, you would let them know that you are among your people. You are among a people who are repentant. And so, God, I pray now that, Lord, you would comfort them with good words today. Good words that you're there, their defender, their intercessor, the one who fights for them. And you're the God who restores and returns and reassures. And if there's someone here, God, who's watching by law online or in this service, God, and they have not yet trusted you as Savior, why not today, God? Draw them Holy Spirit. And if that's you, pray a simple prayer that says, Jesus, come into my life. Be my defender. Be my Lord. Be my Redeemer. Father, I thank you for all that you've done today and all that you'll continue to do through this day and through this service. In Christ's good name, and together we say, amen. Can you give the Lord praise for his goodness today? The Lord, he is good. Now listen, as you dismiss this morning, if you brought an offering, the ushers will be in the back again. Thank you for your, your generosity. But as you leave today, would you turn to two or three people and safely and socially distant, would you speak good and comforting words to them? God bless you, everyone. The myrtle tree will bloom again.